She's probably going to say a bit more about that in her rationale, but um, by way of introduction, she started in anthropology, particularly more kind of cognitive anthropology, which is already a kind of hybrid anthropology and psychology. She then educated herself, or helped, was helped to educate herself in uh, evolutionary biology and what became evolutionary anthropology. Um, and I think all those things are very much, as I say, coloured uh, her approach, but as you'll see. And it's extended recently to cross-cultural psychology and a frustration shared by many that <coughs> only a tiny proportion of what goes on in psychology generally, including developmental psychology, is what might be called non-weird psychology. I don't know if you're used to that expression, weird, it's in capital letters, it's the fact that most psychology, including developmental psychology, looks at Western, educated, industrialised, rich and democratic nations, people. It's only a tiny bit of the whole scope of human nature. So another thing she's doing is correcting that, <coughs> and she's just in the business of um, editing uh, an edition, an issue of child development. Uh, which is about cross-cultural studies of developmental psychology, particularly, <coughs> I think, cognition and social cognition, maybe. She can correct me on that. And I think that's all I'll say, because she'd probably say a bit more about where she's coming from as well as where she's got to, Christine. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is such a treat. Having so many people interested in evolu evolutionary approaches to understanding human behavior, like, all in one place. It's just like an intellectual playground. I'd love to stick around longer. So what I want to talk to you about is, it's a, actually a fairly new line of research uh, coming out of my lab on the ontogeny of cultural learning. Um, and as, uh, as Andy mentioned, my background is, it was originally in, in anthropology, uh, cognitive anthropology, and I, I started to do developmental work really only in, uh, in graduate school. I went to the University of Michigan for graduate training because they offered something called the Cognition and Culture Program, which was really meant to be a fusion of, of anthropology and psychology, a little bit of, of biology, but that was a, a minor part of the training. Uh, since starting my faculty position, I've been doing a lot more in evolutionary biology, cultural, and cognitive evolution. That's kind of captured my interests. So I think of myself at heart as an anthropologist that uses the methodological toolkit of psychologists. So you'll see that fusion um, in my presentation today. So understanding the interplay of our universal human mind and the variation of human culture motivates my research program. So at the biggest possible level, that's what I'm interested in studying. And I propose that examining how our shared cognitive system enables our capacity to use cultural tools, to engage in innovation, but also to become members of diverse cultural groups, uh, really provides important, unique insight into uh, cultural evolution. So that's what I'm trying to understand. Now, the capacity to imitate others is integral to the development of cultural learning. Right? This is one of the primary ways that the young of our species acquires new information from others. And I propose that efficient um, cultural learning requires flexible imitation. And a lot of what I've been studying and a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is flexible imitation and this interplay between imitation and innovation, which is really a, a tension in, um, in human behavior. So you look at these pictures here, right? we'd probably have a very lively and fun debate over whether this is, is uh, intraspecies avian imitation. I would probably not win that debate. That's probably not what's going on there, although it is quite charming there. Um, but I think we'd, we'd all agree in looking at these pictures in that imitation is going on and that the motivation for this behavior is probably not entirely or perhaps at all uh, instrumental. 
Right? So what you see here is a young boy imitating his father. Um, and what's notable about this, of course, other than the fact that it's incredibly charming, is that this child probably doesn't have many whiskers to shave off. Right? And that certainly doesn't deter the child from engaging in the behavior. Because who better to affiliate with than the father figure? So a, a lot of what um, I think we're doing when we're imitating as young children is affiliating. And that, in fact, imitative fidelity uh, or high fidelity, fidelity copying is motivated by affiliating with members of our social group, with our families. So a lot of what children are doing is affiliative. I can assure you that um, this little girl here is affiliating. This is me with my mother. I grew up in Alaska. So a lot of the behaviors that I imitated involved staying warm, which is maybe what you see in Scottish children as well. So imitation, as many of you know, has primarily been studied as a means of acquiring <coughs> instrumental skills, uh, for manipulating the physical world through a process of understanding physical causality. There's actually a very vast literature on imitation from an instrumental perspective. And research on instrumentally motivated imitation <coughs> examines, is really about understanding physical causal rationales for behavior. And um, a lot of the focus of this work is on, or a lot of the recent work on instrumentally motivated imitation is kind of falls under the umbrella of over-imitation. Horner and Whiten, who many of you have probably heard of, pioneered a lot of this work from a comparative psychology perspective. And in fact, the interest, uh, the fact that a lot of the interest in this work came from comparative psychology is very evident if you look at the experimental paradigms that have been used to, to study this. So um, artificial fruit retrieval, puzzle boxes, all these sorts of things. This comes from the comparative of literature. So there's, again, a vast amount of, of research on this particular topic. And in fact, there's another literature that I think <coughs> is heavily related, but really has the, the literatures haven't been integrated on precocious causal reasoning. So we know that young children are incredibly sophisticated causal reasoners, at least under some circumstances. They generate very sophisticated causal explanations. I've done quite a bit of that work in collaboration with my PhD advisors, they can engage in efficacious interventions and make accurate predictions. So we know young children are quite, are quite good at this. And as I say, there's a, a vast literature on precocious causal reasoning. So we've got this work on instrumental imitation, which is based on physical causality. And then we know that under some circumstances, at least, children are very precocious causal reasoners. So how do we explain over-imitation? How do we explain that young children, when you give them tasks that have both causally relevant bits and causally irrelevant bits, that they imitate all of it? What's motivating that behavior? If they're supposed to be such good causal reasoners, what in the world are these young children doing? Are, I mean, we know that chimps are too sensible to do that. Right? We know that, young, that chimpanzees will, will imitate just the causally relevant bits. So as the clever ape, what are we doing with this over-imitation? Um, we used to think that our specialness had to do with our capacity to use tools. I was having a very interesting conversation earlier today about how um, poor children are, in fact, at tool innovation um, under a lot of circumstances. But we know young children can use tools. Young children from a great variety of different cultures can use tools. And we're not even the only animals that use tools. You know, these, these crows are incredibly sophisticated, and, and chimpanzees are as well. So this is, th it's the physical causality in tool use is probably not alone what makes us so unusual um, among animals. And a lot of what I, I want to communicate today is that in fact a great, a huge portion in fact of the behavior that we witness on a daily basis that we try to understand is actually not based on physical causality at all. A lot of our behavior is what I call causally opaque at least from the perspective of physical causality. Right? And don't assume that, that these behaviors that, they, you, that you're witnessing here are exotic and um, behaviors that only um, a very you know, distant cultures engage in. There's an enormous amount of causally opaque behavior in, in Western cultures, in, in all cultures. And again, this behavior has absolutely nothing to do with physical causality. It's not just that we don't know the physical causal basis for the behavior. It's that it is unknowable. 
right? It's not based on that at all. And interestingly, it, that doesn't deter us. That's not a problem at all. And I'll argue that's not the function. Understanding physical causality isn't the function of the behavior anyway. This is what I think makes us special, right? It's our willingness to engage in behavior that's not based on physical causality, that we could never explain in those terms, um, and we engage in this in order to affiliate with social groups. That is one of the functions, that's a major function of imitation. So the big point here is that we're flexible imitators. We imitate for instrumental purposes, and we imitate for um, what I would call ritual purposes. So a couple things I wanted to mention about the relationship between high fidelity imitation in the context of ritual tasks and cultural transmission. So there are a lot of activities that we engage in with very, very high fidelity that probably have some instrumental bits. So this is um, an ava, it's a ceremonial beverage preparation in Samoa. You actually get the preparation of this beverage all across the South Pacific. Uh, I work in Vanuatu, which is a a Melanesian archipelago, and they produce something very similar called kava. And parts of this ceremony, uh, like I say, uh, are, are instrumentally motivated, the grinding of the root in a particular way to produce this beverage, but there's a lot in this ceremony that is entirely opaque, that has to do with um, the kind of dress that needs to occur, that a virgin needs to prepare the beverage, uh, that there's a variety of causally opaque bits that need to occur, and uh, powder needs to be tossed over only the left shoulder a certain number of times. And these behaviors, although full of causal opacity or causal irrelevance, are transmitted with very, very, very high fidelity across generations, right? These are ideal group markers. And that's what I think that's really the function of ritual. Another thing about ritual is that the combination of the causal opacity plus social stipulation makes them perfect for cultural transmission. In the case of ritual in, uh, imitation or conventional imitation, it's really not, I mean, the use of the word over imitation is probably not even appropriate. Right? Because the better you imitate a ritual, the more high fidelity imitation you engage in, the better group member that you are. Right? The goal in ritual is really not to innovate. That's not what it's about at all. It's about high fidelity copying as an affiliative um, behavior. Right? So you see, you see these behaviors being transmitted over generations, and children reproduce these behaviors with very high fidelity and are heavily prepared to, to do so. So in addition to instrumental imitation, children also use imitation to learn rituals. I define rituals as causally opaque, socially stipulated, conventional practices. As I mentioned, affiliation with social groups motivates imitative fidelity. And as Humphrey and uh, Laidlaw would say, in ritual, you're not the author of your own acts. Right? Ritual is not about innovation. It's about conformity with the group. And I do want to point out that I think the social group part of this is really important. So this idea that we have this just general drive to affiliate is probably not right, right? We evolved in the context of social groups, competing groups, in fact, and what we're, we are is motivated to affiliate with our social groups, with our kin, et cetera, not necessarily more, um, more generally. So before I get into this, the bigger picture here is I want to understand how children engage in flexible imitation. How do children know when to imitate with high fidelity, when to innovate, and to what degree? Right? So how do you navigate this? How do children know when a behavior they're observing is a ritual act and when it's an instrumental act? And by the way, it's not, this is not a trivial issue whatsoever. For example, imagine, imagine me lighting a candle right now. Right? How would you know whether that was an instrumental or a ritual act? It could, you, you wouldn't know just purely from the lighting of the, the candle. You would need social and you would need contextual information. Because I could be lighting a candle because I knew somehow that the power was about to be cut and I needed to illuminate the room. Right? I could also be intending to lead you all through some kind of ancestor worship. You shouldn't put it past me. Right? I could be doing that. Right? How would you know? You need social and contextual information. So my core research question is how do children know how to do this? 
Now, if you're in, these are my predictions. If you're engaging in a task you think is about instrumental learning, I would predict that you want to focus on the product, right? It's all about the end goal. You know, even the literature on instrumental imitation talk about, they all talk about an end goal, right? Emulation, really. If, however, you're assuming the behavior is a ritual, you want to focus on the process. All aspects of the, of the procedural sequence are important to imitate with high fidelity. Right? You would uh, an anticipate imitative fidelity should be relatively lower in instrumental learning, relatively higher for ritual learning. I will point out there are cases where I would absolutely predict high fidelity imitation for instrumental tasks. I would expect that to be the case especially for novice learners. So if you don't know a lot about a behavior, Right? It's better to imitate everything, and you can prune down and become efficient and imitate only the causally relevant bits once you've identified them. So with time in instrumental imitation, I would predict a decrease in imitative fidelity. Where with ritual learning, I would, I would expect imitation to, main, to, to remain high over time. With innovation, just the opposite prediction higher innovation in instrumental learning, and lower in ritual learning. As I mentioned before, ritual is not about individual innovation at all. That's not the function of the behavior. So what I want to do is lead you through some of the studies that I've conducted recently in collaboration with my lab on the kinds of information children use to adjudicate between instrumental and ritual learning. Right? So social cues is what I want to talk about next. The first cue that I'll, I'll mention, and we've done this with quite a few different studies, is to use instrumental versus conventional language. So what's really, really nice about using these kinds of social cues is that we can show children the exact same action sequence. And all we do is change the contextual information. So then we can better attribute imitative fidelity to the, uh, the, the social information that we're manipulating and not to any artifact of the task. Right? So that's a, a design feature here. Uh, we've also looked at other cues to potential conventionality, like consensus, single actors versus multiple actors, and also synchrony. If people do things in coordination at the same time, does this increase imitative fidelity? I'm assuming that uh, conventional language, consensus, and synchrony are all, again, cues to the conventionality of a behavior. So how do children determine when to imitate, when to innovate, and to what degree? And are, these, are there behavioral differences associated with learning instrumental skills versus rituals? So keep in mind, in these studies, I'm not just looking at imitation. We have a number of other measures as well that I think are associated. So in the first study, we're going to talk about verbal cues, then consensus and synchrony, and then I'll show you some of my converging evidence that I hope to, to convince you supports these theoretical claims. So instrumental language is meant to prime an instrumental goal, and conventional language is meant to prime a conventional or a ritual goal. So I think what children are doing when they're navigating imitation is making an attribution or an inference about the goal of the behavior. And I'm also, as a developmentalist, interested in the developmental trajectory. So here's one of the studies that we did. We um, keep in mind, children saw exactly the same task. And here, um, in one of the conditions, is between subjects, they heard uh, instrumental language like she puts it in the box or she moves blocks. In other conditions, she heard she always does it that way, or this is how we do it. We've actually done a ton of different conventional language manipulations, and we get the same effects. And then what the children see is, a, um, is a, a, an intentionally causally opaque action sequence. You'll note this is a departure from using the puzzle boxes, right? and there's a, uh, a reason for that. So we introduce totally opaque actions, tapping behavior. We include some novel gestures as well. Note the behavior is always clearly intentional, right? Because children don't reproduce behavior that's accidental, right? We, we already know that. So in some ways, this is silly. This is trivial. 
But I would challenge you all when you go home, look through some, you know, think about some of the behaviors you engage in on a daily basis in your own lives. And an outside observer would surely determine they were just as silly, uh, esoteric, and causally opaque as some of this sort of behavior. So we show them this, and then the first thing we do is we show them different clips of another person engaging in the action sequence. And we ask them, is this the same as you saw before, or is this different? So one of our predictions here, in addition to higher imitative fidelity being associated with conventional language, we also predict that children will be better able to identify deviations between, um, between different actors performing the same sorts of tasks, right? Because the goal, if you're assuming this is a conventional behavior, you want to be very keenly attuned to all aspects. Again, the focus is on the process um, and should therefore be more attentive to behavioral variation. Behavioral conformity, I would predict, is one cue to conventionality, where if there's variation in a performance between actors, that might be more likely to cue an instrumental behavior. So they saw these clips. And they were asked, is this what you saw before, or is this different? And then we gave them the exact same stimuli that they'd seen before and told them, now it's your turn. Right? We didn't tell them to imitate, uh, but we gave them the same stimuli. So there are two, um, there's two different tasks here, two different kinds of dependent measures. So they saw these different clips. So you can see, I'll just show you one. Right. Is that the same as they saw before, or is that different? <coughs> different. What's different? Absolutely, such great imitative learners. Right? What's different there? Different object. Right? Okay. So our predictions are that instrumental language is associated with lower imitative fidelity and less accurate difference detection. Conventional language is associated with higher imitative fidelity and more accurate difference detection. Um, in case you're wondering about the conventional language cues, in case you're saying, well, actually, how interesting is it to say it, they, everyone always does it this way, maybe this is basically telling a child, you have to do it exactly the way that I say. In fact, we have a control condition where we tell the child, actually, you have to do it exactly the way that I say, and they imitate at perfect ceiling in that case. So there's a marked difference between the use of conventional language and a direction to conform, just in case you're wondering. Many people ask that. So let me show you a video of a child. Uh, this is an imi the imitation task uh, in the ritual condition. Children are very shy about the gestures. I'd love to talk to you more about that. They're much more likely to imitate object-oriented behaviors, which is kind of an interesting thing. So a lot of things that are noteworthy about this. Even the fact that she used that object to open the box, I can assure you that is an incredibly inefficient thing to do. Uh, if you, you just give these objects to children, the first thing they do is they grab the lip of that box and they open it with their hand. It's much more efficient to do it that way. Here's a child in the instrumental condition. So she reproduces some of the same the behavior that was modeled, but then she starts to do some generalization. Right. And at this point, and keep in mind she never saw that object inserted into the box, and here she does what I call monkeying around, where she just explores the object affordances. And as this clip goes on, ultimately what she ends up doing is putting absolutely every single one of those objects in the box, <laughs> right? So she's focusing on the goal. The affordance of a box is to put stuff in it. Kids know that. So let me show you the results. This is the, the, um, the, the mean proportion correct for that difference detection task. We find that children are, bet are more accurate in identifying deviation in the ritual condition than in the instrumental condition. Um, also, imitative fidelity. We score the behavior. Um, we use a summary score, subcomponents of the different kinds of actions modeled. And we find that imit children imitate the, in the ritual condition where they hear that conventional language with higher fidelity than the instrumental condition. Right, so as I point out, or pointed out before, 
what children are doing in these tests is using a variety of different kinds of, of social and contextual information to make these um, goal attributions. So in no way am I, am I expecting that there's only one type of cue. Clearly, there are lots of different cues to the conventionality or uh, instrumentality of a behavior. And I want to talk about a few more of those next. So what if you just include multiple actors engaging in the same behavior? Right? How, what effect does that have on imitative fidelity? Uh, so how, what, what does consensus do? How about behavioral synchrony? What I've been really astounded by in reading the imitation literature is uh, how, how much of an over-reliance there is on single child, single adult experimental interactions. Of course, to be fair, that's not just a problem in the literature on imitation, but a more general issue. But I was astounded that there weren't more studies, given the number of papers that have been published on imitation, people haven't just included more than one actor to see what, that, um, what influence that has. So I'll talk about that, and again, I'll talk a little bit about behavioral trajectory. I forgot to mention, in the, that previous study, and in all of our subsequent studies on imitative fidelity, what we find is that imitative fidelity, in, in fact, increases over age. So all of the conditional effects that we get, I'll give you a little spoiler here, they increase with age rather than decrease. And you'll see that next. So here we have another imitation task. Again, this is meant to be a departure from a puzzle box paradigm, specifically because we want to be able to study imitation in a kind of conventional behavior framework. Um, and we've developed a whole bunch of different tasks for this. So this is a different one. And so what you see here, I'll just show you briefly what this looks like. So children see an actor engage in a, an intentional but opaque action sequence, just pushing the pegs down. The tapping, of course, is causally irrelevant. Right? She does something with her hands. So in one condition, we show them that same action sequence in succession, same person. Here we show you know, the single sequence twice, but with two different actors. Here we show them in synchrony twice, and this is a control condition to just control for the num overall number of exposures to the actors. We've got three to six-year-olds here, and we also used, we had a verbal language cue here as well. So half of these um, participants were, heard the, the conventional language prime I told you about before, half heard the instrumental prime, which was she gets the blocks up versus everyone always does it that way. And what we're predicting here is that in the instrumental language single actor condition, this would be the single actor uh, condition, we're going to get the lowest imitative fidelity. And that in the ritual synchrony condition, right, that's here, with the ritual language prime, we're going to get the highest imitative fidelity. So here's what we find. First of all, we replicate the language effect that I, I showed you in the previous study. On average, children in the ritual condition imitate with higher fidelity than children in the instrumental condition. But one thing I want to point out, 99% of imitation studies have been done really with this cell, single actor. Right? Look at how, even aside from the language cues, if you introduce multiple actors, just two people doing the same thing, look at how much that increases imitative fidelity. And then if you include synchrony, you get an additional bump, regardless of the condition. Right? So all of these things, I think, are cues to, or synchrony and uh, consensus, are cues to conventionality. So the next thing I want to talk to you about, and now that we've, we've talked about the, the kind of verbal information that might be a cue, consensus and synchrony might matter, I want to provide some convergent evidence that moves beyond just imitative fidelity. So, what kinds of other behaviors are associated with interpreting behavior as instrumental or ritual or convention? And also, what explains these differences in imitative fidelity? Is this due to, is the child really making an interpretation based on the goal? Do they just remember, are, are they attending to different things? So can this just be explained by memory? And what about functional fixedness? Right, so I'll explain a little bit more why we were interested in functional fixedness soon, but just very briefly, one of the things that we, we thought might be associated with conventional learning is a fixedness in the kinds of objects that, um, in the use of the objects used in the context of rituals. So if you think about um, lots of different ritual artifacts, it makes us very uncomfortable to see them used in other settings. 
So um, rosaries are a great example of this. Right? Using a rosary outside of a ceremonial setting makes us very uncomfortable. So one possibility is that conventional learning is associated with higher functional fixedness of objects used in that context. So what we did here, we had an imitation task, an immediate recall task, a peer transmission task, and a functional fixedness task. Our predictions are higher imitative fidelity in the ritual condition. We use that same uh, language we've used before. We didn't expect any differences in recall score, given that um, our interpretation here is that children are making different kinds of inferences about goals. It's not just that they're attending to different things. Higher imitative fidelity during a transmission task. So in this study, what we, we didn't just give children the stimuli, but we had them interact with a puppet and teach the puppet the behavior after they'd engaged with it, which, trust me, is terribly charming. I highly recommend it. Uh, and then we had them engage in a functional fixedness task, and I'll go through these uh, now. But in the instrumental condition, we have the opposite predictions. Lower imitative fidelity, like I've shown you before. No difference in recall. Lower imitative fidelity during that transmission task as well. And lower levels of functional fixedness with the objects used in the task. So here is our necklace task. As I say, just to convince you, these effects are not tied to the particular imitation task that we use. Um, and my graduate student, Jennifer Clegg, and I developed this bead stringing task specifically because we wanted to do this research cross-culturally. And we picked a bead stringing task because children in all known human cultures are familiar with bead stringing. You'll notice a trend, right? We have some causally irrelevant bits here, like stretching the string. You snicker at this, but wait till you see what children and adults do when they watch these tasks. And again, this is clearly intentional behavior. She selects the items um, very specifically. And keep in mind, she doesn't use all of the items on the tray. Right? That was a design feature as well. So that's the imitation task. And again, we had our ritual and we had our instrumental condition. We coded for imitative fidelity the same way we had for other studies. We looked at whether they stretched the string, how they placed the string, the three bead to forehead touches, uh, which beads they put on the string, and the sequence of the strings. Uh, here are the results for the imitative fidelity task. You will note here that we replicate our previous findings uh, for instrumental and ritual learning. But I included this graph because I wanted to show you the developmental trajectory. So note that this difference in imitative fidelity is greater with time or with age. So in some of our tasks, we've detected this with three-year-olds, but most of the time we don't. We don't find a conditional difference. But by four, we replicate it in every single study that we use, regardless of the experimental paradigm. So these, these difference in imitative fidelity or flexible imitation increases with age. Um, and you'll note that overall imitative fidelity also increases with age. Working memory explains that. Perhaps, uh, surely working memory is part of it, but also perhaps an increasing understanding and more sophisticated understanding of cues to conventionality with age. So we find higher imitative fidelity in the ritual condition, again, as we have with other studies. Here we included an, an immediate recall task. So one possibility in explaining our differences in imitative fidelity is that children are just attending less to the task in the instrumental condition, right? They've already got a plan to emulate, so they just aren't paying attention to what's modeled. And in that case, why is it even interesting that they imitate less? So what we did is we asked them about particular aspects of the action sequence that was modeled to see if they just remembered a different amount of the action sequence based on condition, right? And what we find is absolutely no difference in immediate recall across the conditions, right? So there's no difference. Children in the ritual condition remember just as much, and yet they're imitating with, or sorry, if you, children in the instrumental condition imitate with, uh, or remember just as much, and yet they imitate with much lower imitative fidelity, the imitation task. So it, it couldn't just be attention uh, and memory. No difference in the recall score, right? So here's this pure transmission task, and here we had children with the same stimuli, and this was, um, uh, our little friend, the polar bear. And the, the task here was 
to have the child teach the polar bear to do the same action sequence, which worked just fine. Children were, were quite delighted by this. Here's a child in the instrumental condition. So what you see here is a little boy stringing a lot of beads on a, um, on a string. So he goes on to string everything on there. You know, there's big differences in children's skill in teaching <laughs> others. He's not the most uh, attentive <laughs> teacher. Not a lot of ostensive cueing going on there. But sure enough, he strings them all on. He strings them on both sides. He makes, he teaches the uh, the polar bear there to string beads, right? This is a necklace making task. This is what he does. This is my friend Alex. Oops. And Alex. Okay, so here is a, a girl in the ritual condition. So this is clearly not just something that they're doing, but actually transmitting when they're teaching um, a peer partner. Apologize for the sound, just gonna unplug that now. Ambient preschool noise. Okay. So what we find here when we code for imitative fidelity in this transmission task, we find higher imitation um, in the ritual condition versus the instrumental condition, and you see the effect also increases with age, very much paralleling the imitative fidelity task. So not only do children imitate with higher fidelity by themselves, they also transmit more of the behavior, um, including the causally irrelevant bits. So we have higher imitative fidelity during the transmission task too. Now, on to functional fixedness. This was modeled after a uh, classic task by German de Feder. Uh, what we have here is Bobo's house, which my students are not especially skilled in constructing these, given that they used immensely thick plywood, which weighs, weighed a ton, and we had to cart this thing around. But anyway, they tried. And so the task here is we got Bobo the panda bear, and Bobo wants to meet his friend, the tiger. And so the task is they need, children need to use these items to get Bobo all the way up to the tiger. And we had to explain Bobo's a panda bear and he can't jump, because children already thought of that. Mm -hmm. Spring legs and then forget all the objects and just jump up to reach the tiger and we explain pandas don't jump. Anyway, all these things you realize after you design studies. So we told them you have to use these objects. Now here we had the ritual and the instrumental condition, but we also manipulated whether the beads, again, this is the necklace that they saw before in the imitation task, we manipulated whether they were or were not on the string, right? So that's our pre-utilization um, uh, condition here. Previous research has found that children find it are more functionally fixed when objects are pre-utilized. So what we thought was that a combination of the ritual condition or ritual interpretation plus um, pre-utilization would be associated with the highest levels of functional fixedness, right? So keep in mind, some of these objects are excellent um, blocks, they're, they're excellent building blocks, and some of them are, are absolutely useless, including a pencil, an absolutely flat magnet, and a, a little mini car, which is very unstable in stacking them. So we gave children these stimuli, that's the optimal solution, in case you're wondering. All right, so let me show you the, 
some videos here. This is a child in the instrumental preutilization condition. Right? You'll notice this child is, is quite savvy here. They really were enamored with the jumping idea. Note he takes the blocks right off the string. Check. No problem at all. Here's a ritual pre-utilization condition child. So this, the beads are on the string again, but she was in the ritual condition. And keep in mind, this, the ritual designation is from the imitation task they participated in first. So far, so good. Nice sturdy tower. Keeps them on the string. So she notices they have the affordance of a block. But rather than slip them off the string, she stacks up the magnet, the coin, and the car. Right? So what we found is that in the ritual pre-utilization condition was associated by the um, by far the most. This is reverse coded. So this is the percent of children solving the task. They're much less likely to successfully solve the task in the, in the pre-utilization ritual condition. Presumably, I mean, one, not presumably, one possible interpretation for this is that the uh, experiencing that necklace, that object, in a conventional setting has increased her, um, or decreased the capacity to reason flexibly about the object. So we have some evidence that children are more likely to display functional fixedness um, in this combination of a ritual and um, pre-utilization condition. So there's some evidence here, I think, across a number of studies, that interpreting a behavior as conventional increases imitative fidelity, that differences in imitative fidelity may be due to interpretation rather than just attention or memory. There's converging evidence across measures. So we found we have evidence from that difference detection task, from a pure transmission task, from a functional fixedness task. So we're not relying on simply one kind of dependent measure. And we find increases in imitative fidelity, memory, and transmission with age as well. Right? So in addition to our experimental manipulations, we also find these improvements across age, which others have documented. So what I want to talk to you about next is what this looks like outside of the cultures that are most typically studied in, in psychological research. So outside of the West, outside of these, this historically recent weird child rearing environment that we subject our offspring to, do we get the same sorts of things, right? So do children use the same sorts of information um, in learning instrumental skills versus rituals, which of course exist in all cultures, um, as we find in the West? As I mentioned before, uh, one of my field sites is in Vanuatu. It's um, a Melanesian um, archipelago. And the reason that we work there is that the, um, it's one of the very, very few places left in the world that hasn't had Western education kind of uh, introduced um, very widely. Uh, they also, the population lives in very much um, the same sorts of environments that uh, we would have lived across most lived in a, a, across most of our evolutionary history. These are very small scale societies. People live in villages, uh, and so what we want to do is look at these sorts of behaviors in socialization environments that are probably much more representative of the kind of environment that human psychology evolved in. So this research that we've done, we, we actually study a lot of different things in this field site. I'll talk to you uh, for the purposes of uh, this presentation about our imitation work, but we've done a great 
um, variety of different studies here. We also do a lot of observational work. We look at children in, uh, in their daily lives and the kinds of activities they engage in. We look at peer interaction. And children in, in, these, um, in these villages actually spend the vast majority of their time with their peers or with caretakers other than their parents. They learn a great variety of different sorts of skills. This is the, uh, a bundle uh, of palm, uh, palm leaves with these dumplings inside made of taro and sweet potato that they steam over fire. That's their primary food source. And even very young children participate in, uh, in these sorts of activities. This is me peeling hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of sweet potatoes over the course of, of, um, of my field work. Because in this context, you don't, no one sits around and does nothing, not even the scientist, whatever that is. So in this study, we looked at whether imitative fidelity is also higher in the ritual conditions. So we translated our protocol into Bishlama, which my students and I speak, back translated. And we looked at whether there's cultural variation in imitative fidelity overall. So in a culture where there's more reliance on observational learning, um, perhaps higher expectations for conformity, maybe we get higher imitative fidelity more generally speaking. So we have a cross-cultural comparison of cues to instrumental and ritual behavior. We have the weird context of Austin, Texas, uh, and the less weird context, much less weird, the motto for, see, you don't get the joke because you're not from Texas, bless you all. But anyway, um, the, whole, the motto of the city of Austin is like, keep Austin weird, and it kind of plays off this weird thing, but <sighs> bygones. Okay, so here's our imitation task. And here's our, our Nivon uh, research assistant. And she models the same necklace making task we've used before. Uh, we have, again, same predictions for our experimental manipulation. The instrumental language is associated with lower imitative fidelity and just the opposite for the ritual condition. So here's a, a Nivon girl in the ritual condition. looking very similar to what you find in um, our, our studies in Austin. No problem at all with the causally opaque bits. Very careful to select the correct item. And what we find is that uh, we, we replicate the experimental difference between, or the conditional difference between instrumental and ritual cues, right, in Vanuatu, we have here. So we find that same effect. Um, and we find, in fact, absolutely no difference whatsoever in the ritual condition across cultures. Very high, I mean, look at how high the imitative fidelity is. They're already very close to ceiling there. We do find a difference in, uh, between countries in the instrumental condition. So we find that the Nivon children imitate with a bit higher fidelity uh, in the instrumental than in the ritual condition, although keep in mind it's still lower than in the ritual conditions. So we do have some cultural variation there that could potentially be due to different expectations in, in conformity. Um, so we find that overall imitative fidelity is comparable in the US in Vanuatu, but we do find this difference in instrumental imitation, um, probably or possibly due to better observational learning. Um, there are a number of factors that we would need to, um, to examine further to kind of determine that definitively. I, just, I put this, this uh, picture up here because this is really how young children spend most of their time. This woman here is, the, um, is his granny. Note that he uses her dress as a mat. And dogs and pigs are in perpetual conflict over food scraps. So the animals, they do have domesticated animals. Uh, however, they don't, they don't feed them. They don't, they don't in, put them in enclosures. So the pigs and the dogs have to be very um, entrepreneurial in acquiring food, uh, as do the chickens. So this is pretty much, you've got people around all of the time all kinds of different um, productive activities going on, like food preparation. And this is where young children spend most of their time, not in fact in dyadic interactions with their primary care caregiver or caretaker. So what I want to talk about last, uh, just briefly, is some new work that we're doing on uh, 
that's really examining how children learn instrumental skills and rituals through parent-child interaction. So I've shown you what children do in these tasks, but what do children do in, um, in combination with their caregiver, right? Are adults, are parents uh, responsive to the same sorts of cues as children are? So this is, is new work, and we're looking at how parents scaffold children's imitation. And again, are they sensitive to the same sorts of social cues? So here we use a um, familiar activity, that necklace making task. And it's really the very same study, except we include the parent. And by the way, we didn't set out to study this. Uh, but like we were talking about earlier today, uh, Western parents find it irresistible to, um, uh, they're, they're kind of irresistibly drawn to getting involved in their children's behavior. So in doing these studies, we found that parents constantly got involved and interrupted. And so we thought at some point, let's just see what they do and let them get involved directly. Right? So here's a video of a, a father and his daughter. Again, Austin, Texas, the live music capital of, of the known world. This is a children's museum. These guitars are entirely gratuitous. I can't explain them. Uh, but this is, uh, this, by the way, this man is an engineer for Dell Computers and just heard the conventional cue. Here's the necklace making task. No, we never said exactly. That's his interpretation. The future of American engineering, my friends. She's three, by the way. You can see he's committed to this. You get the point. Here's a child in the instrumental condition. This guy's also a Dell engineer, by the way. Now, which, what do you want to put on the necklace? Okay, great. So he is explicitly encouraging innovation here. Right? The goal here is to make a necklace, any kind of necklace that you want. So he scaffolds the fine motor skills. What should we put on next? Well, let's see. She's going to be back in a second. Do you want to pick something else to put on? Yes, yes. Yeah, there she is. Do you want to pick <laughs> another piece to put on the necklace? What else do you want to put on there? Right. So he's emphasizing individual choice. They go on to make multiple necklaces, not the exact necklace they saw before. And he reproduces absolutely none of the causally irrelevant, silly bead touching, things like that. So what we find is that even with parents involved, you get more imitative fidelity in the ritual condition. You also find that there's more scaffolding behavior. There's more parents demonstrating or encouraging action in the ritual than in the instrumental condition, where parents are more likely to encourage innovation and making whatever necklace that you want. So we've got some evidence, and again, this is, this is brand new work, that parents reproduce the same sorts of behaviors as children when they, are, when they receive different kinds of social information. So children are clearly not indiscriminate imitators. They're highly flexible, and they are highly attentive to contextual and social cues. Um, so just to sum up, efficient social learning requires using imitation and innovation flexibly. That I've provided evidence for a number of cues that children might use to adjudicate between instrumental and ritual learning, both verbal and nonverbal cues, right? So it's not just language, also the number of actors and synchrony and convergent data across measures. Imitative fidelity, uh, the difference detection, also peer transmission, functional fixedness. We've got some evidence for quite a bit of cultural continuity, but also some variation. And this is a topic ripe for further research. And we find that parents scaffold instrumental and ritual learning in ways consistent with our theoretical prediction. I did want to mention very briefly, I don't have time to discuss this work in this talk, but we're doing a, a whole bunch of research looking at ritual and social group affiliation. Because what we really want to try to demonstrate or examine is whether imitative fidelity, 
in the context of ritual is driven by affiliation. So we have some evidence that rituals increase fusion and preference for in-group members. We've done this in the context of children's preschools where we've introduced rituals. We've also looked at in-group ostracism where we use cyberball paradigms to prime um, the experience of ostracism and then looked at imitative fidelity um, and all of the, the new data that we're um, collecting on this topic. Uh, demonstrate that ritual is motivated by drive to affiliate. So stay tuned on that. We've got lots of research that's coming out on that topic. I want to thank my fantastic lab. All of this research is collaborative. My postdocs, Rachel and Andre, and my graduate students, Jennifer, Justin, and Nicole. Uh, my funders, uh, all of this research was funded, or the majority of it, by a large grant from ESRC, uh, the Templeton Foundation, National Science Foundation, McDonald Foundation, all of the foundations, many of the foundations. My collaborator collaborators, Harvey Whitehouse, Paul Harris, Susan Gelman, um, my postdocs and graduate students, and you for your attention. Thank you. OK, uh, Christine's uh, open for questions. I'm wondering whether you, you, you brought about uh, causal opacity and, and want to take it a stage further and say, well, let's get rid of the actions and see about beliefs. And, and here, that, I mean, there may be 1% of beliefs where if you've got a bit of dirty coffee, there's a safety up and um, mm -hmm. overtraining. But I just wonder whether you consider belief because these are you know, causally impossible but, um, in, in most cases of religion. Do you, could I, just, you know, I was going to say, like in religious cases, where well, so people it, may not believe that doing this, this ritual. <coughs> Yeah. Really, has instrumental effects. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry. New scientists this week discussed beliefs, and, and actually, in, in most forms of life, they're just about as, as little evidence based as, as there is for religion. But Perhaps it's testimony based. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's a fascinating question, and I, I think about that on a daily basis. So there's a big tension in the literature on ritual, which is almost, I mean, the truth is, there's almost nothing known about ritual psychologically at all. In fact, psychology neglected religion and ritual and many of the topics that anthropologists have studied most extensively um, for a number of different reasons. So there's, not, there's very little work on this, but there is tension in ritual studies on whether, whether ritual is practice or belief or both or how these two things um, reinforce each other. Right? So how important is belief in the efficacy of the behavior and what influence does that have? And as you, you mentioned, uh, belief is almost always entirely opaque. Um, and that's, by the way, that's true for ritual, that's true for religion. That's also largely true for science. So we have this impression that as scientists, the behavior, or not the behavior, but the beliefs that we have are based on somehow our firsthand experience and active exploration. But most of what we all know about science, we believe because someone who we think is educated and knowledgeable told us it was true. Religion is very much the same way. So now the, the process by which this information acquired is presumably, we would hope, different. So they're not entirely interchangeable, but it's, the, I think, looking at belief and the opacity of that and how it's transmitted is open for investigation. We haven't studied that specifically, but we could actually tweak some of these experimental paradigms or the general logic of that to look at that in particular, and I'd love to do that. It's a really great idea. Did you? Uh, sorry? Yes, I think. Um, I noticed in one of your videos, and I think it's often been done that over imitation or, you know, I don't know whether it should, really should be called over imitation of the ritual, but we, we always assume that they're doing it no matter how many times. In fact, sometimes it's assumed that the more times you do the, the irrelevant action, the more you're copying. But actually, you're demonstrated a certain number of times, and doing it more than that might not be, might be doing the ritual wrong. And I'm wondering, do you code, do you code that separately, and should it be thought of as separate? So you, um, you're referring to, for example, the, the multiple like head the, touch. The multiple head yeah. touch, the string touch, or so one guy, uh, one boy do to four or so. Excellent question. We've coded this every possible way you can imagine. And what we find is that the, um, that really doing the behavior at all, 
is 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 most predictive or or that introduces all the explains all the variation so we find that children who do one head tap um, our overall imitative fidelity is identical to children who go ahead and do all three. And we also want to account for just differences in working memory. So, I mean, part of this is we, we find that older children are more likely to do all three head taps than younger children, regardless of the condition, that sort of thing. So we've, been, we've, we've coded the behavior for, um, for greater or, or lesser imitative fidelity, and age is what predicts most of that. But yeah, great question. Is it, you still got a question? Yes, yeah. yeah. It's just a clarification. Could you maybe comment uh, briefly how you do the imitations for? Well, it, it does depend on the, the task. Uh, but for the necklace making task, for example, we code for. Or the teaching task, for instance. Oh, for the, the yeah, just, transmission? Yeah. We coded for exactly the same thing as in the imitation task. In that case, remember the video that you showed with the little girl? that was really into teaching the, yes. is that a high score or a low score? That's a, that's not a perfect score, so it's a scale. Yeah. Um, but that's a higher score, certainly relative to, um, I mean, keep in mind, we're expecting relative differences in the frequency of reproducing these sorts of behaviors. Yeah. The, the reason I'm asking is that the little girl is, for instance, instead of taking the block and put and touching her own forehead, which is what she saw in the shrinks in the talk. She was touching the little bears. Yes. Instead of bringing the necklace to her neck, she brought the necklace to the neck. And then I would expect that to be a low fidelity. Well, in that case, so that, um, the instructions for that task are to teach the, or, or to show the bear how to do the task. So although we coded for the same behaviors, we only coded them if they, um, if they, for like the head touching, we coded those for both the, um, the model and the puppet. So if they showed either one of them, and we, we, we found no difference in whether they um, modeled it themselves or modeled it on the puppet. Right? But clearly the child is attempting to transmit this behavior to the, to the puppet. So we, there's, there's actually not a difference there and we coded for the same actions. But I, I find it astonishing that you would code that as low fidelity. Well, I, it's like <laughs> I guess it depends on, if, if you start with the assumption that it, you just have to define when do you, when you, you're comparing two things, right? The uh, two behaviors from two different people, and then you have to define when do you code it as right. the same so, or so not. For the fidelity. And if I do this, or if I do that, either I, I could, argue both ways. I could argue that I can code this as the same behavior, touching the forehead, right. or I could, I could code this as different behavior. True. But keep in mind, they've done an imitation task with themselves already, prior to this. So this is, in fact, the second task that they have done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I picked up on the same thing. I was going to ask you the same thing. I realized I was asking about that touching on the forehead. Just one basic question. How, how often, roughly, do you know, yeah, how much do children do it, as it were, by putting it onto the other's forehead, as opposed to on theirs, do you know? Do you know? Is that they they put it on. They, doing both. they almost never put it on their own forehead. Really? In, in in, let me clarify. In the peer transmission task, yes. in the imitative fidelity task, they put it on their own forehead. Yeah. But this is a. They are told to teach the puppet, show the puppet how to how to do it. So, yeah. but it, it is. I mean, it's an interesting thing. They almost never do it on their own. In yeah. that one. It, it, given that, so they are being asked not not to demonstrate how to do it. With, with, in which case, you know, you should do that, but to teach them how to do it. And one way in which, you know, some people try and teach is to mold yeah, the other's hands and actually, yeah. like so they were putting it in their hands. So that's maybe a bit more like that. So I don't know, I think you have to sort of accept that being asked to show the other one right. how it to do it, not, on not the purely demonstrate. Yes, but I it's fascinating that, that they, some right. of them do do it that way and, and others do it this way, because, you know, part of the whole interest in imitation is the translation between what it is for me to do it and what it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Amanda, a question. Um, I was interested to know, so you've got through these two stances that you're suggesting children can take a ritual, ritualistic stance, this is a ritual I'm going to interpret the behavior in one way and copy it in one way, or instrumental. Mm -hmm. In your instrumental condition, so the reason I'm asking is I want to understand how this dovetails with, say, the natural pedagogy. Yes. 
explanatory framework for why children copy in such high fidelity, which would rather be that all action is interpreted, as far as I understand it, as long as it's signaled in a sense of way as being for you, and you should you know, more or less do it how I'm doing it. Um, and you seem to have, you know, sort of, I, I would just like to know like, how you see your, those two theories interacting, and in particular in the instrumental conditions, are children still over-imitating, or are they um, sort of going more around, okay, I know how to make a necklace, I'll screen off all the irrelevant acts? Great questions. I'll answer the, the, the second one first. In the instrumental condition, they do imitate some of the causally irrelevant actions. So it's not that they absolutely never do, they just do markedly less than the, because they're relative differences. Um, but they do sometimes, uh, just at, at very low rates. So um, that's the second question. The first question is, there are a couple of things about the, the theory of natural pedagogy that I think are, um, well, there's things that are incredibly compelling and I think get human psychology right. But there are also things that I think are a function of studying weird populations. So there, the use of ostensive cueing, I think, is universal. I think all children can learn that way. I think that there's a now um, an, a mountain of evidence that Western populations or Western parents are much more likely to engage in didactic pedagogy than the rest of the, the, the world. That this, this caregiver, infant, object-oriented, you know, heavily um, scaffolded teaching is not representative of what most child-rearing is like. And eth uh, people who do ethnographic research in small-scale societies have been claiming this for years and years and years and years and years. So there's that issue. And it's, it's not that you don't get teaching. I don't buy at all that you don't get teaching all over the world, because you do, because teaching is the most efficient way to learn some things. But most of what children learn, uh, and the way they learn, is observationally, by watching peers, by watching parents. And I think that there are cases where high-fidelity imitation is the most um, useful thing to do, right? So in the case of ritual or convention, you would expect high fidelity imitation. But in cases where there's a more efficient way to do things, right, why not, you know, why not be flexible in what you reproduce? That's where I think a lot of human innovation comes from. So if children interpret a behavior as, as instrumental and the goal is, is, is retrieval or whatever the case is, that the, um, the primary objective should be reproduce the outcome. And if you can introduce a more efficient way to do that, why wouldn't you? So I, I don't think that, that the theory of natural pedagogy is, is um, inconsistent with this. I just think it's incomplete, that children don't over-imitate always. They, they do in, in instrumental cases and conventional cases, but for different reasons. And as I mentioned over time, in the case of instrumental over-imitation, the more children know about the box and the causal affordances of the puzzle box, say, the more they omit those irrelevant bits over time. And we know that many people have documented that, um, including some people who've worked as part of this group. Uh, Sarah, yeah. yeah. I have a follow-on, actually, based on your response to Amanda's question. So have you yet done the teaching task with the um, cross-cultural sample? Yes. And given, so connecting a few questions that have been asked, given that you were just saying that in these non-weird cultures, it's more uh, common to learn without this kind of a sense of cues and via observation, when these children, if they teach the ritual uh, aspects, are they more likely to use their own head than the puppet's head if they're learning via observation rather than these kind of ostensive engagement techniques themselves? Yes, excellent questions. Um, first thing, just a purely pragmatic issue that we found, we did the peer transmission task, we did it with a puppet, and that was a disaster. They did not understand the puppet as an interactional partner. I mean, they thought the puppet was tremendously charming and soft and sweet, but the idea, there's something kind of insane about treating a little bear as an interactional partner. So, I, I mean, it, we, we can do this in the West because children are used to engaging with stuffed animals in this way. So that was uh, deeply problematic. My graduate student was devastated because here we collected, the, the goal of this was to do something that was um, uh, comparative in the sense of you know, cross-cultural. Uh, so what we did is we modified the task to include a, a peer interactional partner. And there, it worked just fine. 
children were able to do this, but then that changes the, the interaction profoundly. So did we have children put the, the bead on the forehead of another child? Most certainly not. Right? That would be a truly, just in terms of interpersonal interaction, that would be strange. So in that case, they would put it on their, you know, they would, they would monitor gaze. Right? So you use ostensive cueing everywhere. And this is clearly a, a case where they're transmitting a behavior. And there's no other way to learn it other than to instruct. And they would put it on their own forehead. But again, this was in the context of a, so we're, we're collecting follow-up data using peer inter, um, interlocutors in, in the US. But yeah, the puppet, that was a bust. They did like the puppet, but no, they were not gonna, they looked at the, at the experimenter like you have truly lost the plot with this one. Uh, can't have any dignity with, as a developmental psychologist. You have four-year-olds mock, mock you to your face. It's, it's fabulous. But it's funny when you think about you know, so much of developmental psychology being criticized for be, being with weird populations, <laughs> but an enormous amount of developmental psychology is done with puppets. You know, yeah. the theory of mind, you know, when does a child you know, read the mind of a puppet? Um, anyway, a, a passing comment. Uh, I think we should probably draw the formal part of this to an end, and uh, we'll take Christine for uh, a well-earned drink uh, next door. Anybody here is... Um, Welcome to come and join her. In fact, I'd like to thank the audience for being here. I was a bit anxious earlier on because it's Easter Friday. Would we have an audience? We've had a great audience and lots of questions. And uh, I know there are quite a few people here from the wider Temples Project group on cultural learning and a particular environment to come in. At least say hello to Christine and, and uh, uh, yeah, say hello. We'd <laughs> uh, love to come for a drink and, and chat. Speaking of rituals, yeah. Easter's yeah. perfect time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Think about your Easter celebrations and causal capacity. It's not <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can we uh, thank Christine for a picture?